First off, I want to thank you all for coming. I'd like to introduce a couple people. Pat Cashman is the owner of Cashman's. He started the business 36 years ago. He has been a good friend of mine since I was 15 years old. He helped me get my first company started and he's just been a good friend. I started using Hagard three, four years ago. I switched from propionic acid and it really worked out well. I never dreamed I'd be selling it or doing any of this. I called Pat up and Terry and told them how much success I had with the product and Pat said he wanted to try it. And it kind of snowballed to this. Um, where's Terry at? Terry kind of runs the outdoor operation here at Cashman's. Tony over there kind of runs the inside operations here. Um, Greg Noble is the, what's your real? Sales manager. Sales manager. <laughs> John Ashworth is, what's your title? Sales rep. Sales rep for Hagard. <laughs> Both of them are Hagard guys. Um, John's going to get do a presentation on the actual Hagard side of this. Hagard is a preservative to allow you to bale your hay at a higher moisture. It works real well if you have good ventilation on your hay once you bale it. It's not a miracle. I'll be straight honest with you. If you're going to think you're going to put it up inside of a hay mow that has no ventilation, I ain't going to sell it to you. It won't work. You have to have ventilation. John? Thanks, Scott. Can everybody hear loud enough? All right, as Scott said, uh, this part of the presentation is going to be specifically about Hayguard, uh, what Hayguard can do for you and, and how to use it. Um, when you talk about hay and you talk about hay quality, the difference between poor, fair, and good quality hay is usually determined by when and how the hay is harvested. Hey, John, um, As Scott was pointing out, he, he went through a lot of the details about mowing, raking, baling, storing hay. Um, but that's primarily the difference between good quality hay, poor quality hay, is, is how you put your hay up. If you feed poor quality hay, it significantly increases the feed cost that you need to meet your animal nutritional requirements. And it also can cause significant health issues to your animal if you feed hay that's full of mold. Um, harvesting hay at the proper maturity, especially in this area, the humid east, is often very difficult to do because of the conditions that we have. So that's very important that you know exactly where your moisture is and what you're doing. Experts recommend that you bale hay at 15% or less to avoid mold, yeast, and bacteria growth and nutri nutrient damage in your hay caused by heating. You can bale, as Scott said, dry hay at higher moisture levels as long as you use a preservative. But knowing the moisture of your hay is very critical in determining whether or not you need to be applying a preservative or not applying a preservative. People ask me all the time, why bale at higher moisture levels? And you know, there are really two reasons. The first one's because you have to. Depending on the time of the year and where you are, uh, you may not be able to get your hay dry down. Or your hay's almost ready to bale, but thunderstorm's gonna come in and you got to be able to bale that hay and what do you do? It's 18% moisture, 20% moisture. You've got to do something to it because the moisture level is too high. Or the other reason why you bale hay at higher moisture levels is because you want to. If you're using an alfalfa or alfalfa grass mixed hay, if you bale it at higher moisture levels, it makes a higher quality feed. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. What are the different factors that affect drying time? You guys all bale hay, you know this. The type and maturity of the hay at harvest, the wind speed, humidity, sunlight, temperature, whether you've got soil moisture, uh, you've got low and high air areas in the field, and then you've got your stand quantity and your variation within the wind row. Now Scott talked about some of the equipment that you can use to try to even out that wind row variation. But you're going to have wind row variation if you've, got if you've got stand quantity differences throughout your field. 
This is a chart that uh, is in the packet that Scott handed out to you. It's probably one of the most important things for you to look at and take away with regards to baling hay. This looks at wind speed and humidity and its impact on the ability to dry your hay down. Uh, when hay is drying, water evaporates from that hay. Right at the surface level of the hay, the humidity is around 100%. As long as there's moisture coming out of that hay, down at the ground level, your humidity is around 100%. Now, it may say 60% or 70% on your, uh, when you're checking humidity on the Weather Channel or on your phone, but at the, at the level of the hay, it's around 100%. So what happens, the wind speed, wind will come in and it'll bring drier air in and it'll take the wetter air away. And so the more humid the air that's brought in, the longer it'll take to dry down. So in this environment, if you look at that chart where it's talking about relative humidity, at 65% relative humidity, the driest your hay is gonna be is 18%. Now there are lots of days where we have a very short window of time where our humidity is lower than 65%. And so if you look at that, that right there tells you, you may think your hay's dry, but your hay's wetter than you think it is. Soil moisture. This chart shows the impact of soil moisture and sunlight at different temperatures. And I won't go into a lot of detail, it's in your packet as well, but if you look at the 80 degree temperature and you look at a cloudy, wet soil, cloudy day wet soil versus a sunny day and dry soil, it takes 23 more hours to dry your hay down from 80% to 20%. So all that tells you is that you've got to pay really close attention. This, this spring, we had a lot of days where we had very wet soil, very humid air, and it took forever to get hay dry. And that's the reason is that when you're looking at cloudy and wet versus sunny and dry, there's a significant difference in the amount of time it takes to dry down your hay. If you can bale at a higher moisture level, then you can get in that field sooner and bale it and that won't impact your regrowth as much as waiting until the hay is really dry before you get in and bale. Um, we talked about baling because you have to. This is a slide that kind of talks about baling because you want to. This shows the effect of moisture on leaf loss on alfalfa. And if you look, when you first cut your hay, you're about 80% moisture, you got 50% leaves, 50% stems. As you dry your hay down, your stem to leaf ratio changes if you look at that 10 to 15%, you've got somewhere around a 40% leaf loss if you bale at 10 to 15%. If you bale at 20 to 25%, you've got somewhere around an 18 to 20% leaf loss. So you can pick up significant volume and quality by baling alfalfa hay at a higher moisture level. So why do that? Why worry about the leaves that you have in alfalfa? Two reasons, quality and quantity. 90% of the vitamins, 75% of the protein, and 50 to 75% of the digestible matter are in the leaves. So the more leaves you save, the more quality you have. Also, you harvest more tonnage per acre. If you bale at 20 to 25% versus 10 to 15%, you can pick up 20 to 30% in yield. And that's not moisture yield, that's actual hay yield in leaf matter. So you add more value per ton due to higher quality and you get more tons. This is an on-farm trial that was done in Pennsylvania. We baled some hay, treated with hay guard at 20%, waited till the hay, rest of the hay dried down and baled it at 12%. You can see the difference in crude protein, 16 to 22. You go down and you look at your dry matter intake, 2.5 versus 3.4, but the big thing to look at is the relative feed value difference. Hay at 12% dried down had a relative feed value of 122. The hay baled at 20%, same field, just baled at higher moisture, had a relative feed value of 182. That's 60 points difference, which basically is a dollar a point of relative feed value. So that's, that hay had $60 per ton more value than the hay that was baled at 12%. And not only that, but uh, the feed, relative feed value is gonna lead to better weight gain um, and more milk production, depending on whether you're, uh, what, what, you're, what you're feeding, cows, horses, whatever. There's two types of moisture in baled hay. There's dew moisture and there's stem moisture. The dew moisture is on the outside of the stem and leaf. It's caused by humidity and condensation. It's normally rapidly removed by sunlight and, or light breeze. 
However, as I said before, high humidity, ground moisture can significantly increase the time required to eliminate dew moisture. Stem moisture is what remains in the plant stem during the field drying process. It's not rapidly removed by, uh, in the windrow. And it can't be measured by normal common moisture meters. It is also the most common cause of mold spoilage and fire. High moisture can cause issues if you don't treat it properly. Uh, most fields have high to moderate levels of mold and yeast and bacteria on the plant when you cut it. If the moisture content is above 15%, those microbes will grow, consuming nutrients and generating heat. Heating can produce black hay, you've seen caramelized hay. Uh, in doing so, they ba you basically have uh, taken all the nutrient value of the hay away. Uh, if the hay heats enough to become very dark brown or black, uh, the protein in that hay is pretty much non-digestible. So you basically are feeding nothing but fiber. You get no nutritional value out of it at all. The effect of moldy hay on horses can be significant. Uh, moldy hay contains spores that can cause COPD in horses. It's a respiratory disease that limits their ability to breathe efficiently. Uh, once a horse gets COPD, it has COPD for the rest of his life. Nothing you can do about it to eliminate it. Uh, molds can have other detrimental effects, uh, causing digestive upsets, uh, and they can also contribute to colic. And some molds have mycotoxins that can cause refusal to eat, weight loss, absorption problems, gut irritation, low energy, and some mycotoxins can even cause death. So it's pretty important that you minimize and limit the uh, growth of molds. Accurate measurement of moisture of the hay at baling time is critical to knowing whether or not you need to treat your hay or not treat your hay. Basically, as far as moisture meters are concerned, there's two types. Cashman's offers both of them. Both have pros and cons. You've got a probe or you've got a moisture meter that's mounted on your baler. Both of them use electric conductivity. Uh, the problem with the probe or the, the benefit of the probe is less expensive, but you've got to get off your tractor and stick the probe in the bale a number of times to be able to determine what the moisture level is in the bale. The one that goes into the tractor cab or in, in the baler chamber, uh, it is more expensive, but it gives you a real-time look at what your moisture levels are so you can decide whether or not you need to be using a preservative or not using a preservative. As Scott mentioned, uh, the, um, the moisture meter that Cashman sells and the one that we recommend is the Agritronics BHT2. It's got two pads, one on either side of your baling chamber. It works on small square balers, round balers, big square balers, uh, and it retails for around $400. The uh, handheld probe's around 280. <clears throat> Scott mentioned that one of the most important things about storing wetter hay is, or one of the most important things about storing it and keeping it is, is the kind of storage. Uh, most hay will lose some moisture during storage Small rectangular bales lose the most, big square bales lose the least. Hay will eventually get to an equilibrium point of about 15% moisture. But if you have 100 tons of hay in your barn, baled at 20% moisture, in order to get to 15% moisture, you have to lose 1,200 gallons of water. So if you so take if a actually small do the square math. bale right there, you're looking, at, you're looking at having to lose three gallons of water per bale. Per bale, it's got to come out and go somewhere. And if it goes up in the attic of your barn, it's going to condensate and come right back down on your hay. So that's right. Without adequate ventilation, the moisture will condense on the top of the building and then fall right back down on the hay. And so you continue to have moisture going up, moisture coming down. That hay never is able to dissipate that moisture. Uh, for closed-sided barns, like Scott was mentioning, ridge vents with ventilators are suggested. Um, ridge vents allow the warm air out but it's important that you have space on the bottom so that the cool, drier air can come in, and then it takes the moisture and takes it out the top of the building. The key is, the wetter the hay, the better the ventilation you need, or the more ventilation you need. But ventilation is the key to putting up and keeping 
wetter hay. You can put all the preservative on it you want, but if you don't have ventilation, you've got problems. This is uh, an example of a couple, a couple of different examples. Uh, the top right hand is uh, Scott's warehouse where he keeps his hay. He showed you that in his video. The bottom is, uh, is a smaller building. Uh, it's got a nice dry gravel surface. It's got ridge vents on the top. It's got floor vents on the bottom. So you can pull the, the drier air in and then out of the top goes the moist air. So we talked a little bit about all the things that you need to be concerned about. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Hayguard. So what is Hayguard? Everybody's heard of, of propionic acid. First thing to know is Hayguard's not an acid. That's one of the beauties of it. It's a non-acid preservative that contains a combination of sulfur compounds. Those sulfur compounds help reduce mold and yeast. Sulfur salts have been used for years in human foods, uh, in preserving fruits and preserving vegetables. Sulfites are used in winemaking to pull the oxygen out of the bottle of the wine so that it doesn't turn to vinegar. So sulfites have been used as a preservative for a long time. When, when you apply them to the hay, they're activated and they basically grab the oxygen that's in the bale and pull it away from the mold and the yeast and the bacteria so that it can't grow. Propionic acid is a contact killer. We're an oxygen scavenger. We pull the oxygen away from the mold and the yeast so that it can't grow. It's safe and effective for all types of hay, whether it be alfalfa, whether it be grass, whether it be alfalfa grass mixture, small grains, anything you're baling, Hayguard works on. One of the things that a lot of people think is if they're baling wet or hay, they need to, they need to loosen up their bale so that they can let the moisture escape. That's exactly the wrong thing to do. You want to keep that nice tight bale so that Hayguard stays within the hay, keeps the oxygen away. If you loosen the bale up, you have the opportunity for more oxygen to get into the bale which is a problem. So that's one of the keys is don't go and loosen your bale up just because you think you're going to let more moisture out. You actually let more oxygen in. Application rate for baled hay. Propionic acid, the wetter the hay, the more you have to put on. For hay guard, it goes on at two to four pounds per ton up to 25% on small square and round bales. The reason we have a range is that if you're hand stacking bale with very small stems or very little stem moisture, you can go with two pounds. If you're using a bale baron or a bale bandit or a stack wagon where you're making a really tight package, we recommend going with four pounds. But the application rate is constant. You don't change it as you're baling hay. Depending on what type of system you have, if you're at a two pound rate, you put it on at two pounds. If you're at a four pound rate, you put it on at four pounds. You don't have to vary it. So that's a plus and an advantage over propionic acid where you have to have the ability to change the rate as you're baling. Anybody have large square bales? You have large square baler. Large square bales, we go two pounds up to 20% and then four pounds up to 25, uh, 21 to 25%. How about, how about large round bales? Large round bales is the two to four, two to four depending on how you're storing it and then what kind of conditions you're in. But it's, it's the same as small square bales. Stand up and. If, if we have dry stems, we know if we have dry stems, that the new moisture isn't going to be as big of a problem because that new moisture does dissipate easier, faster than stem moisture. We have large stems, and I know, like, especially here in Ohio, there have been a couple of years where we've had wet springs, we've had a little bit later getting off first crop hay and we get the stems under the size of straw. And, and when that happens, we also have the increased level of mold and yeast bacteria that's on the plant. So it's important when we look at that, whether it be a small square bale or round bale, that we say, okay, we've got bigger stems, we're going to have more stem moisture. We know we probably have more bacteria that's coming off the field. We need to increase the rate of hay that, What that's going to do then is provide more of the chemical, the sulfites, the sulfur, to go back and fight that mold and use the plant preparation on that. So I think that two to four application rate, you really need to stop and 
look and say, what circumstances are we, are we dealing with? In most cases, good normal years, two pounds per ton works really well. But when we're dealing with those out of the normal circumstances, we need to go to three to four to make it work the And I'm only a phone call away. Call me. I'll advise you the right way to go if there's any questions. Scott showed you his Coons accumulator. Uh, these are pictures of Bale Baron, Bale Bandit, and a New Holland stack wagon. If you're using a Bale Baron or a Bale Bandit, they're putting a bunch of small square bales together and either strapping them or tying them up with twine. The middle of those Bale Baron and Bale Bandit stacks, they can't breathe at all. We recommend if you're using those, you use four pounds all the time, starting at about 12% moisture. And that way you'll protect the middle of that package where you typically wouldn't do that if you uh, didn't if you used the lower rates. Just a little bit about the difference between Hagard and propionic acid. Um, propionic acid starts at four pounds and goes up to 16 pounds per ton, depending upon what kind of bale you're making. We're two to four. Um, Hagard has no odor. Acid has a very strong smell. And there are no safety issues. With acid, they tell you to use goggles. They tell you to use rubber gloves. If you get it on your hands or your clothes, it can burn. Um, it's just not really a good chemical to work with. We were talking yesterday. Um, propionic acid, like I said, it, it burns. It's an acid. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to drink it. Uh, Hagard is made in a food grade chemical plant. It's used in food preservation, the, the same chemical. Which would you rather be feeding to your animal? An acid that burns your skin and burns your eyes or a product made in a food grade chemical plant? It just kind of something to think about. Hagard or propionic acid is EPA controlled. If you look at the label on propionic acid, it's got all kinds of warnings on it. It has to be EPA registered. Um, acids are classified as a non-restricted pesticide. And like I said, Hagard is made in a food grade chemical plant. And in the state of Ohio, if you make over 500 acres and use propionic acid, you actually have to have a license. Right. And you get more hay treated per container. So if you look at a drum of propionic acid, it will treat about 90 tons of hay. And Hagard will treat anywhere from 138 to 275, depending upon whether you're using the two pound or the four pound rate. Um, the other thing is when you fill up a 25 gallon applicator, you can bail a lot longer with Hagard than you can if you put 25 gallons in, uh, of acid in an applicator. So it gives you a much longer bailing time before you have to refill. Uh, this is just an example of Hagard, or Hagard versus propionic acid. Um, really the point here uh, if you look at the moisture, it's about the same. Uh, the protein's about the same, so you would expect that two preservatives are going to preserve the hay similarly. One thing to point out, sulfites reduce lignin. Lignin is the non-digestible part of the plant that helps it stand up. So lignin is, or Hagard sulfites are natural lignin reducers. So if you reduce the amount of lignin, you see here it reduced from 7.5 to 6.9, what you do is you increase the digestibility. So you can see the digestibility at uh, percent at 48 hours went from 50 to 51 and a half, basically. So it gives you a more digestible uh, forage source to feed to your animal. And it also gives you about a five point bump in relative feed value. So it just shows that reducing that lignin makes it more digestible and increases the feed value. This slide shows Temperature per day of Hagard treated hay and untreated hay baled at 25% moisture. And typically that day five through eight is when you're going to get the most heating. And that's when you have that mold growth and that bacteria growth and you start getting dust. And you can see that on days five through eight, the Hagard treated hay was 22 degrees cooler than untreated hay, showing that we've pulled the oxygen away from the mold so that it's not growing. And that's what generates the heat. This is a, an example of the impact of using Hagard on both quality and quantity. We looked at a 50 acre field. We got an extra ton per acre because we have more leaves. So that gave us 250 or 300 tons versus 250 tons. If you look at the difference in relative feed value, there's about a $60 per ton difference. So we calculated that. So it says that on that same 50 acres, by using Hagard versus not using Hagard, you can generate 
$63,000 versus $37,500 if you were to value your hay, if you were selling hay or if you want to value the hay to your operation. Come on. If you take into consideration, we use, we use $3 per pound and we use three pounds per ton as our application rate. So you actually use $2,700 worth of hay guard on that 50 acres to get that yield. If you look at the difference after you subtract that out, $22,800. So you're basically getting an eight to one return on your investment, which I think any banker would pretty much tell you that's a pretty good return on investment. So this kind of brings home the fact that not only is it quantity, quantity but it's also quality and it improves the value of your hay operation. Several reasons to use Hayguard all the time, not just when your moisture meter tells you it's above 15%. Uh, like I said before, you got uneven wind row. Uh, you got high and low areas in your field. You got tree lined areas. You got different circumstances that have hay as you go through the field. Your moisture meter may not even pick up the fact that there's a difference there. Um, it produces softer, greener hay. That reducing of the lignin helps make the hay softer whereas acid makes hay more brittle, so you got a softer hay to feed, uh, and it lets you start baling sooner and stay in the field longer. That's one of the big things in, in this area is that if you can get a couple extra hours at the beginning of the day and a couple of extra hours at the end of the day, that may mean the difference between getting your hay baled or having to come back the next day and finish baling. So it gives you that opportunity to stay, get in the field earlier and stay in the field longer. If you already have an applicator and have been using acid, we have a procedure to convert that over to Hayguard, and Scott has all that information. If you don't have an applicator, as Scott said, we recommend dormant applicators. There's one on this baler back here, and you have a brochure on your uh, table that has all the information about dormant applicators. Uh, winterizing applicators, uh, this is something else that comes with the dormant applicator, but just wanted to mention uh, it is important that you flush the applicator at the end of the season and winterize it to protect the pump. It's also important to store Hagar properly. It will freeze, so it needs to be stored someplace where it's not going to freeze. The other thing is, is that if you see that tote there, it's a little more than half full. So there's a lot of space in the top of that tote. Well, as I said, Hagar is an oxygen scavenger, so it will continue to try to eat oxygen all the time. And so if you leave it in a container that's got a lot of space in it over the winter, it will continue to eat oxygen and it actually will have some of the sulfites fall out of suspension. So what we recommend is that you make sure that it's in a container that's at least three quarters full or else you put it into a smaller container for overwinter storage. Hagar will leave a white film on the baler. That's just the sulfites that are on there. It's very easy to wipe off. We recommend that as you go through the season, you clean your baler up, just spray it off, and that gets rid of the white film on the baler. It's not gonna cause any problems or any issues. It's just something that we want everybody to know it's gonna be there. The other thing is, is those salt crystals, if you don't remove them, they can build up over time. And so we recommend that you just take a spray bottle of water and just spray the tips off after each use and then before you start using it again, the next time and it keeps those salt crystals from building up. And the take home message for Hayguard is that it's safe for all animals, has no odor, you get no feed refusal, no acids, keeps the hay greener, softer, more nutritious, and you get fresher, more palatable hay. That's basically the story. Thank you, John. Do you have any 